Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for another very interesting session, an important session, because the Constitution, as we know, is somewhat under threat in South Africa at the moment. Werner Zeebrands has more than 50 years of municipal experience. This includes being a municipal manager of three different municipalities, Bragpan, Ruderpoort, and Overstrand. He's a municipal consultant, and as a professor, head of the Department of Municipal Governance at the University of Johannesburg. He holds qualifications in law, public administration, and business management, and is an advocate of the High Court. In 2015, he exchanged the crowded Hermanus for the tranquility of Betty's Bay, where he serves as deputy chairperson of the Ratepayers Association. Bernard, thank you very much for addressing us this morning on this very important topic. And thank you for your preparation. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gert, and all the listeners, the members of U3A. As an introduction, I want to say I'm not a legal practitioner, and these views are my own views and interpretations. You'll see that I've start off with the Bill of Rights uh, and not the whole Constitution. In my next dis uh, talk, I will focus on specific aspects of the Constitution, but because the Bill of Rights plays such a dominant role, I thought to make it a separate discussion. So I'm going to focus on the bit of the history of the Constitution, then the contents of the Bill of Rights, and eventually the implementation thereof. We talk about 26 years of democracy, but that's a full democracy. Obviously, we had democratic government years ago as well. As a matter of fact, the interim constitution was adopted by the so-called illegitimate government of that time. So that was part of a democratic system. I refer you a bit to historical background for a specific purpose. We might recall the Anglo-Boer War, the second one, was from 1899 to 1902, it's a three year period. A bitter war that devastated the country in many respects. And it took a period of seven years from 1902, actually from 1903 to 1909 to hammer out a new constitution that established the Union of South Africa. And I mentioned that because it was so complicated at that stage to reach a consensus there. In 1960, we had the Republic of South Africa Constitution, which was eventually established in 1961. In 1983, the government embarked on a tricameral parliament system where Indian, brown or colored voters and white voters were represented in parliament, whereas let's call it African people were excluded and a sort of a consolation prize were given a degree of independent local government in the townships, which wasn't well received. As you know, on the 2nd of February, uh, F.W. de Klaat announced the release of Mandela and unbanning a lot of the political parties. And then and this is where the significance of that time period comes in. Within three years, we had an interim constitution, uh, dramatic years that uh, took away decades of apartheid structures, it took away actually centuries of bias by white people against black people. So to reach that in three years was, I think, a major achievement. Then we came to the final constitution in 1996. Final in the sense that it has been amended already 17 times, and we're busy with the 18th amendment of that constitution. What are the characteristics of this constitution? First of all, it's, it's a drastic departure from the Westminster system. Those of you who are old enough or have long enough memories well, remember that in 1953, the then government couldn't pass certain legislation because it needed a bigger majority in terms of the Union of South Africa constitution. So all of that, it enlarged the Senate, loaded the Senate with its supporters, 
and voila, there was the majority that was required. And it was, it was a bit underhand, but it was totally legitimate in terms of the Westminster system where parliament is supreme. We've now changed and we went to a constitutional state and where the constitution is supreme. And we hope that will be the case. It's been lauded as a wonderful constitution being upheld in many respects, but I'll talk about it a bit later. If you want to understand the Bill of Rights, you really have to do a study of the Freedom Charter that was adopted in 1955 in Clipton. When you read the Freedom Charter, which was adopted by a number of uh, political parties at that stage and groupings, the introductory words were as follows. We, the people of South Africa, both black and white, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. It lays the foundation for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people. When you go to the introduction, the preamble of the constitution, you'll find exactly those same words repeated there. They come directly from the Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter was in essence a list of wishful thoughts perhaps, but those things that enslaved people, those aspects that uh, hindered the freedom of people, and that's why the, the Freedom Charter must be understood in order to understand the Bill of Rights. The, free, the Bill of Rights contains the shortest and longest provisions. And, then, and the shortest one is just a few words. It says, everyone has the right to life. It's the shortest one. And we can question the whole validity of that, do we all have the right to life? Isn't life soon extinguished in many respects? The longest provisions relate to the rights of criminals. Two and a half pages of rights established there. And that's why we often have the arguments about a person being allowed out on bail or not in the protests uh, but those are the two important ones in terms of length. We have constitutional supremacy, as I indicated, and the rule of law. And in order to change the bulk of the constitution, you need a two-thirds majority. Some of you might not be aware of this, but the Nationalist Party, when it at Codesa, demanded a 75% majority. And then at one stage, the ANC grouping came forward and suggested as a compromise, they started off with uh, two thirds, and then as a compromise suggested 70%. And with hindsight, that was one of the biggest mistakes the Nationalist Party people, that they were not skilled negotiators. They had preconceived ideas and thought they could still dominate uh, with past history that they could dominate those proceedings. And we missed the golden opportunity of having a 70% entrenched in the constitution. I'm now going to show a few slides, which I have the permission from Zapiru. You'll notice that most of these slides are slightly old, but they are still so valid. So that's why I decided to retain them in this presentation. As you will recall, this specific slide caused a huge uproar. But I would like you to have a look at the characters there. It's the ANC, the SACP Kosatu. And can you see who's the ANC Youth League guy there? He said he will defend that president till his death. Now, the next slide. And isn't this ironic? The very same argument. We respect the law, the justice system, when it suits us. 
Now, the judicial authority, I'm going to be very quick about this, is vested in the Constitutional Court with the Chief Justice, the Deputy Chief Justice, and nine others, and the quorum is eight, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the High Courts, the Magistrates' Courts, and a lot of other courts, Labor Courts, uh, there's going to be a new court on the expropriation of land that's envisaged, and so we can carry on. Our judicial authority is very well established with, um, at the apex, the Constitutional Court. And the courts, and this is important, are independent and subject only to the Constitution and the law. They must act impartially, without fear, favor, or prejudice, and no person or organ of state may interfere with the functioning of the courts. And this is why the Judge Schlope case is so important, because he allegedly abused his position to influence judges of the Constitutional Court. Now, this matter is still being dealt with. He has been found to have transgressed that by the Judicial Services Commission, but uh, it still has to go further. There's a long road to travel on that one. But at least it is in terms of the Constitution that there was action against Judge Schlope. And here, Muhu, Muhu, stay and don't bother me while I'm working. Strange that there is this conflict still between the two of them. We, here we can perfectly see the separation of powers that there should be. As you can see, perhaps they're above the head. There's the executive, and here we have the judiciary, quite clearly. What are the Bill of Rights? It, the, it has a horizontal and a vertical application. It originally was only horizontal, in other words, between citizen and citizen. And now it's vertical because it also goes from citizen to organs of state. And it also applies to natural and legal persons. So as a company, for instance, you are bound by the provisions of the Bill of Rights. And so is the state. It's allowed to apply and further develop common law. We've had quite a few cases of that development of common law, whether the old Roman Dutch law or Roman law or the indigenous common law. Your rights are only limited in terms of a law that generally applies. Uh, or to use a little example, you're not allowed as a rule to be bodily searched. That's covered in the Bill of Rights. But you've all had the experience when you set off the alarm at an airport. The next thing you know, they're frisking you and they're checking whether you're not carrying explosives or sharp knives or something like that. And nobody complains because that is a law that is generally applied to all people. And we accept the need for that law so that can restrict our inherent right in terms of the Bill of Rights. Where there are conflicting rights, they will be determined eventually by jurisprudence. Now, we start off with the rights, enshrines the rights of all people. This includes people from other countries. And I'm going to refer now and then to court cases. For instance, there was a court case of two Mozambicans and they wanted access to medical care. And they said, well, you're not citizens of this country. And the court ruled, no, it, it protects the rights of all people, not only South African citizens. Now, section nine on equality, the, the focus is there on unfair discrimination. Now, of course, I can discriminate fairly. Using again that same example of the body search at the airport, you can thus advertise for a female body searcher, in other words, who can then do body searches of women. Uh, you're not going to you have a, perhaps a lot of male applicants, but they are going to be disqualified and that will be fairly disqualified. I'm going to refer to a few cases, the Christian Education South Africa. They want its corporal punishment still to be allowed. That's part of the dogma. 
uh, the courts ruled, the court, constitutional court ruled, no, it's not allowed. And you know that this is generally applied now. And if you breach that, if there is corporal punishment for uh, learners at schools, the teacher is or the education provider becomes the victim. Judge Satchwell was in a relationship, permanent relationship, this woman, with another woman. And her partner would like to have the same benefits. In other words, if Judge Satchel were to pass away, the pension benefits should then accrue to a same gender partner. And the court found that that is allowed. And as you know, today, it's quite common that you have same gender or same sex marriages. And of course, the benefits that flow from that go from the one to the other. In terms of African common law, women and minors were excluded from inheritances. Uh, it's a very paternalistic system still that prevails in terms of African common law. And the court then found that this was unconstitutional and that women and minors could actually inherit from the, the male head of the household. I've already referred to same-sex marriages. The Masia rape case was a very interesting one. It was a nine-year-old girl who was raped, but only. The court had to find, was this, first of all, was this having sex against the will of a person? And at the same time, there was also a case reported of two men where the one was raped by another man. Now, in the case of Masia, the court found that that was indeed rape. Uh, they suggested in the case of males, that could also be the case, but because it wasn't an actual case before them, they didn't give a final decision there. Uh, unfortunately, in the Masia case, this interpretation came after the event and the rapist wasn't uh, given the full penalty that should have been there. Pele, very interesting, she was a young girl uh, with Hindu religion and she wore a nose stud to school. You know, these typical little nose studs that the Hindus wear. And the school then said, no, no, this is jewelry. You're not allowed to wear that nose stud. Eventually, it went to the Constitutional Court. Eleven judges applied their collective minds and said, you cannot discriminate on the question of religion. Uh, it must be treated equally. This is the equality provision. And happily, the young Pele could in future wear her nose stud. This, you might remember the cartoon or the painting rather, of the spear of the nation with Zuma's sex organ prominently displayed there. And now if you read that, so we played the race card, whipped up a frenzy, the painting got conveniently destroyed and we bullied city press into removing it from their site. Right. And you'll see there, I have a country to run. Now, this is quite often still the case. It becomes problematic when you want to protect your rights and you get this kind of reaction from government officials or other persons who come with that kind of argument and destroying the rights, in this case, the rights of freedom of expression. Now, human dignity, and here with this Mokpanyami case, was a very important one. This was the first case where the question of the right to life and human dignity were combined together and the judges found that as a result, the death penalty was deemed to be unconstitutional. And since then, it has not been implemented again. And those on death row were eventually sentences were amended. Kami Shell was an interesting case as well in the sense that this poor woman was raped, viciously raped and attacked by a person who'd already been charged 
He's a well-known criminal, had been previously charged, and then while out on bail, again, raped another woman. And the court found in her favor that she was entitled to be receiving compensation for that from the state because the state was negligent in this regard and said that the courts must apply the bail requests with more circumspection. A similar case was South African railway commuters where uh, certain people on the Trasa lines were viciously thrown off the, row, uh, off the train carriage. And uh, the court took a very dim view of the Trasa's security arrangements there and found that they should upgrade that because you are a victim inside that rail carriage. You have nowhere to go. And once attacked by muggers, and robbers, you are simply thrown off and most probably to your death. There was another interesting one. There was a research done on HIV and it was an academic product. It was well done, it, it, but unfortunately in the process, they listed the names of the people who formed part of this HIV research. And the court then found this was a transgression in the sense that the human dignity and privacy were offended by this, although it was a purely academic work. And they should have sought the permission of the respondents, alternatively have used fictional names. The right to life, I have referred to that very briefly, and we can think a lot about that. There was an interesting article the other day that the one police colonel who started selling firearms that had been previously confiscated or handed in, they've traced those firearms to more than a thousand deaths in the Western Cape, gang-related deaths uh, from the action of one person. So he definitely, as a police officer, didn't play his role in protecting the, life of, the lives of people. Freedom and uh, a security of person. The Walters case, again, created a, a problem for many people uh, in the civil society. But this actually was a police related case. The legislation at that stage provided that the, uh, a police officer could on reasonable grounds and depending on the circumstances could actually kill a person without incurring liability in that regard. Now this was found to be contrary to the constitution and it's rolled over now to the civil society. So if you find a person on your property and you were to shoot that person in self-defense, you can have a major problem. I want to relate to two similar cases. One is the well-known Oscar Pistorius case. He argued that there have been uh, forced entries into the properties there. He thought there was a criminal hiding in the bathroom and he shot in self-defense being legless. Uh, and as you know what the outcome was, eventually it was not only culpable homicide, it was found to be murder. Now, even if that were to be an actual criminal, the outcome would probably have been the same. So be very, very careful uh, when in cases like this that you don't exceed the boundaries of uh, protection. You might also recall a recent case of uh, Peter van der Westeisen. He was Just van der Westeisen's brother. And at the church service, some robbers and muggers moved in and held a pistol against the, the pastor's head. And he then shot the person holding that pistol and somebody else. He was deemed to be a hero. And I said at that stage, be careful, he's probably going to be charged with murder. And then recently in the press, it was said this, they withdrew the case and then said, no, no, it's still being investigated. 
Right. The termination of pregnancy also was brought to the court's attention, and that's why the legislation that uh, abortion on request has been deemed to be within the framework of the Constitution. Slavery, servitude, and forced labor, yes, we don't. Uh, that's a reaction to the Freedom Charter, privacy, freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. Now, this is Mr. Prince was a candidate attorney, but he was found with Dacha on his person. And he said, well, I'm a Rastafarian. I smoke Dacha for my recreation and I should be allowed to do this. Now, at that stage, it was deemed, no, he wasn't smoking the Dacha. He was probably dealing with the Dacha and his arguments weren't well prepared, maybe because he was still a candidate attorney. But later on, as you know, this Dacha issue has evolved and now it's allowed for private use and can be also, the Dacha plant can be propagated for private use. Now, traditional or cultural marriages, there's been a long series of issues here, especially Muslim marriages and traditional marriages. You know, if I were to have married three women, I would not only have had three mothers-in-law, but I would probably be charged with bigamy. But a person like former President Zuma had multiple marriages, and it's quite common in the African tradition that you pay the necessary lobola and get the permissions and you can have more than one wife. I think King Goodwill's Relatini had, I don't know, about a cluster of about 12. So something like that. It's not uh, an offense in terms of those traditional marriages. Freedom of expression, it's very, very liberally defined by our courts, and it's only when it comes to hate speech. Now, hate speech, I want to go in this these Sparrow case, and there have been many, the guy and the Greek beach there, you know, these cases, and uh, you've got to be so careful because the, mo the moment it's hate speech, your freedom of expression ends right there and then. On that banner there, it says free speech. And, well, let's hope that sister is still going to keep on fighting. But look what happens. Right, 17, assembly, demonstration, picket and petition. The, the key words there, it should be peacefully and unarmed. I have a major problem with this because throughout South Africa on a daily basis, and I'm going to bring this in, uh, in line with number 21 that you can see their freedom of movement and residence. Our freedom of movement is severely hampered by all these demonstrations and picketing that takes place. And we can get more and more of these as the uh, municipal elections are approaching. And Whereas it should be peacefully and unarmed, it's not happening. I've reported this personally to the Human Rights Commission more than a year ago. I have a, a case number. Nothing, but nothing is happening on my case in this regard. The Human Rights Commission is very swift to act on Ibn Etzebet and people like that and the loft of boss that uh, refused to have a same-sex marriage. Then they flex their muscles all the way. But when it comes to confronting people who create havoc, violence, and impede the freedom of movement of other people, nothing happens. Freedom of association, by implication, it also means freedom of disassociation. Political rights, it's, it's widely structured, and this is why it's important for our municipal elections that are coming up. And then citizenship cannot be taken away from you. This you might recall in the old TBBC countries, if you you became then a member of the Transkei independent state and you lost your South African citizenship, uh, that can no longer be the case. 
the freedom of trade, occupation, and profession. In the interim constitution, it said you have the freedom to exercise your profession. In the final constitution, it was changed and it said you have the freedom to choose your profession. Now, there's a clear distinction. What happened between 1994 and 1996, for instance, prostitutes were legally allowed to practice their profession without being charged in terms of any other law at that stage. And you could also find that in many cafes, some of you might remember this, there were these one-armed bandits that you have in casinos. You said, well, I want to operate this casino type of machine. That's, my, that's going to be my profession. That's what I want to do. And uh, this was allowed in terms of that interim constitution. Today, it's different, of course. You have the freedom to choose. Nobody can compel you to, to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is. I perhaps have a question there. If I choose to become a medical doctor, for instance, fine, allowed to do that. But then after I become a doctor, I still have to do my house year and I still have to do the two Zuma years, as it's commonly called. And yes, it's, I'm not exercising my profession, strictly speaking, because I can't go into private practice. I'm still obliged to pay for that to the state in the form of, let's call it forced labor. Section 23 on labor relations. Now, bear in mind that labor relations in South Africa has played a, a very important role. While the political structures were banned and they were in exile, ANC, PAC, all of them were in exile. There were so-called uh, governments in exile who were at the coalface of fighting for the rights of the deprived people. It was the trade unions. And this is where people like Cyril Ramaphosa and Shalowa and Mbuweni, all of them flexed their muscles there. That's where they became powerful. And uh, they were extremely successful because our labor relations legislation changed drastically as a result of those pressures. This was still in the apartheid government. There has been a very strong trend now through labor legislation in general to protect the rights of people. Uh, here we think, for instance, of the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, uh, Employment Equity Act, and numerous others that are involved, the Skills Development Act. And it's right that this should be done. We should have good labor relations and labor legislation. But what has happened is that it's become predominant and the rights of the employers have been watered down. We can see that, for instance, that in the interim constitution, employees were given the right to strike and the employers were given the right to a lockout. In other words, they could close the gates of their business and keep out the striking workers. That was a constitutional right. In the final constitution, this was changed. The right to strike was retained by the trade unions, the workers, but the employer now has recourse to labor legislation. And to have recourse to that, they have to follow a rather difficult procedure, far more difficult than the trade unions have to follow. And we can perhaps belabor this point uh, quite a bit, which I don't intend doing. But if we look at the whole economy of South Africa and why it's not getting off the ground, all the economists will tell you our labor legislation is so inhibiting it is very difficult to attack the interests of any 
uh, worker or trade unionist in South Africa. I just want to use one or two examples. We all know that Eskom's staff structure is totally bloated, hopelessly bloated. And there was a move afoot to cut back on that. And eventually they were not allowed. The government said no. All these workers, whether they're necessary or unnecessary, you've got to keep them employed. And it's now through a process of natural attrition that they are slowly but surely decreasing the numbers at Eskom. In the meantime, it's hitting the economy very badly because we've got to keep on paying these exorbitant salaries. A similar case, of course, we all know was with the SAA. It had the highest ratio of employees relative to passengers or aircraft. You can use whatever measurement tool in the world. And that was eventually the demise of SAA. Did we learn the lesson? No. We're going to do a phoenix trick here and resuscitate a corpse and make sure that it's going to get wings and fly again. We'll see how that goes. At the moment, there are something like a thousand people working for the SAA who are, to the best of my knowledge, not doing anything because the SAA is not flying but they all being paid full salaries after increases, et cetera. We, we saw this in many cases. The post office has now been found to be trading in a state of insolvency. Why did this happen? It's because the employees went on a long, long strike. Uh, I said at that stage, they're striking themselves out of a job. And this is what happened. People in South Africa, reverted to alternative methods. If you go to England and the USA, the postal system is still very much in place and you can get your post through the normal mail. Right, the environment. It's a, a third generation, right? So we way ahead of many other countries, including environmental rights, especially uh, what you don't see there is NEMA, the National Environmental Management Acts, there are a host of them, at least five of them with lots of regulations, and they are very beneficial. The, the problem is, if I can call it that, is that as a developing country, we are perhaps a bit overregulated. And again, this is hampering the development of our economy. The application of these laws is not done uniformly. In the Western Cape, we become a bit of a victim of this in terms of the strict application of this. Now we can go to property. Now here's the big one, big debate today on the issue of expropriation without compensation. Of course, we can have a whole discussion just on this clause. This is the 18th amendment, proposed amendment to the constitution where it's envisaged that the constitution can now be amended to include expropriation without compensation. A lot of people, myself included, are of the opinion you really don't need this because the current provision is adequate in the sense that it allows for specific cases to even reach null compensation, what is now envisaged. Applicable cases is where land has been abandoned. Nobody wants it. It's just lying there and the state can take it over. I have a case in a certain town where as a municipal consultant, I was approached two cases actually in the Eastern Cape where people bought property. They don't want this property. They want to give it away. Uh, it's useless but they still have to pay property tax on it and availability of services. One is on a failed golf course estate. And these are pensioners. They can't get rid of this property and they would love it to be expropriated at no compensation by the state, but nothing is happening there. So it's possible. And if you risk obtain this land in uh, other way, uh, it could be that it gets pretty close to no. 
In my next talk, I will be referring again to this whole property issue. There are certain interesting things regarding that. It seems like this process is going ahead. The Constitution actually only referred backdated claims to 1913. That's what the Constitution says. Now we're finding land claims going back even centuries before that. The Khoisan say, no, 1652, all this land belonged to us, and we want to stake a claim for that land. This whole question of restitution of land rights has become a major problem in South Africa because it's not being dealt swiftly. And once an application has been lodged for restitution of land rights, that land becomes virtually frozen. Uh, I was involved in Bapalabora, where the municipality wanted to establish a new waste disposal site. But 93% of its municipal area was under claim of former landowners, whether they were actual, it's not always possible to determine, but it, let's assume it was. It's a major problem. Even uh, the phosphate mining and the copper mines were the subject to land claims. Section 26, housing. In the run-up to the 94 elections, housing was a major issue. It said, everyone has the right to a house. You might even remember there were promises made. We'll just throw in a few washing machines and dishwashers and fridges as well. And it was stated that they would be proper houses. Now, as you might know, the old so-called matchbox houses built by the old government were approximately 45 square meters in size, and they were deemed matchboxes. In Bella Bella, they built houses of 20 square meters, which is still quite common today, 20 to 25 square meters. And the people said, but this is half a matchbox. And the minister turned around and said, well, we're giving you a house. What are you complaining about? And the constitution was changed. You're now gaining access to adequate housing. You don't have a right to a house. You have a right to have access to ad adequate housing. What is an adequate house? It's 20 to 25 square meters. Fine. And then it's further limited within the state's available resources. If they don't have resources available, they simply can't do it. Whether it's monetary or administrative resources, it doesn't really matter. And then the progressive realization of this. It's another escape clause that was built into the final constitution. At the moment, we are probably moving away from this, what we call BNG breaking new ground or RDP houses. The government realizes it simply can't afford to do this. When we started in 1994, the waiting list was 2 million. They built a few million and the waiting list is something like 4 million. It's never going to work. You are not allowed to be evicted from your home. Remember that it's not the house and your home has been found in the courts to be a few dead branches with plastic covering over it. And if you sleep there at night and you go to work in the morning, you come back that night and you light your little fire there uh, next to University of Cape Town, it's your home and you are not allowed to be evicted. We saw this now with COVID-19, it, it became even stricter. In Cape Town alone, they've had more than a thousand land invasions. And the moment the people are there, they cannot be removed unless you have a court order now. And how long does it take to get a court order? So it's become a bit rampant. In the Joe Slova squatter camp, that's where it all started with about 20 odd thousand people couldn't be moved on ground that they occupied where a housing project was on the go. And the Hrutboom case, this involved a family in Cape Town where they occupied land illegally. The court said, you are illegally here, you must be evicted. But there were children and the children have a right to have access to housing. The children's rights must predominate and you can't have a six year old living in the squatter camp on his own. So therefore the parents can live with the child and that's where the Grootboom case came in. 
healthcare, food, water, I'm going to be quick, but quicker here, reproductive healthcare, that's where you can now have abortion on demand or request or termination of pregnancy, that's the better terminology. The right to emergency medical treatment, uh, what does that mean? Subramani was an Indian gentleman who frequented the Addington Hospital. He had a severe kidney problem. He had to go for kidney dialysis twice a week to the hospital. And after a year, the hospital, and this is quite a few years ago, said, but this guy is costing us 60,000 rand a year. And this is not emergency. He has a permanent ailment. So we're not going to treat him as an emergency anymore. He then took this case to court. Eventually, it landed in the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court determined that this was not emergency medical treatment. It was run-of-the-mill treatment. He got the decision, and the next day, Mr. Subramani died. Whether it was of shock, we don't know. There's been speculation about that. A treatment action campaign, you remember the withholding of the treatment for AIDS victims. Uh, this was in Becky's time. And with the TAC then campaigned for access to antiretroviral medication. Joburg water and other cases, they can cut off the water, but you must provide water within at least 200 meters from a house. Sasa, there was recently a case about this, the social security, that you have the right to have access to that. Strange that you have to take the minister to court. Then uh, children, I've referred to the Khrutwum case. There have been other similar cases where if the rights of children are affected, they get preference there. And there was at one stage legislation that in terms of which the certain jail sentences had to be imposed on uh, minors of 16 and 17 years old. Uh, this was changed and said, no, it's now optional. It depends. It can still be done. You might remember the Griquastat case where this uh, youngster sh uh, shot his parents and his sister. He was younger than 18 and he could be sent to jail. So it's not an absolute exemption there. Education, Many education cases. The Amalur one was where it was an Afrikaans speaking school. The education department went to them and said, Right, we're giving you 112 English speaking children. You must now immediately start with bilingual classes. And they disbanded the governing body and tried to enforce this. The Amalur case then went to court and eventually it was decided that it was illegitimate of the MEC to disband that and to impose that. Today it's different. You still find that slowly but surely you find very few schools that now can say they are unilingual. A language and culture, cultural, religious and, and linguistic communities. I have referred to the Dacha cases, Rastafarians. There's one group in Neisner that is practicing that at the moment. The key here is this secrecy bill and the anti-media lawsuits. And it's still there. The muzzling of the press, muzzling freedom of expression in spite of what the Constitution says. And we can look at other issues with a little halo there, which I rather liked. And in this case, whoops, the can of worms is opening right there. Access to information, which we've, a lot of us been involved with, just administrative action. The Joseph case created a lot of problems for municipality. What Joseph and a few other people were illegally occupying a building in Johannesburg, but they paid the electricity. The landlord didn't pay the amount over to the municipality. The municipality came, disconnected this building, and then Joseph and his fellow residents said, but we have proof that we actually pay. You can't just cut off the electricity. So the court then came and said, right, in future, all tenants must receive 14 days notice before you can disconnect the electricity. And it's still the case today. So municipalities are having a problem time with people who are not paying their bills and saying, 
sorry, do you have a reason why you're not paying your bill? Because if not, then I'm going to disconnect your electricity in 14 days' time. By then, he has absconded. Access to courts, this includes legal aid. As I said earlier, arrested, detained, and accused persons have more rights than anybody else. I'm going to conclude the evaluation of our Bill of Rights. We've had following judgments in similar cases in other countries, predominantly, interestingly enough, from Canada, which has a more modern constitution. We've expanded the common law in South Africa in the South African context. I would say the jurisprudence for interpretation of the constitution has been very positively expanded. It's growing the whole time. And one might question one or two things, but the body of jurisprudence is very well developed and very positive. What we do find, there is a trend to favor socioeconomic considerations of a strict legal interpretation. And you find this trend becoming more predominant in certain cases. For instance, the whole question of the land grabbers in Cape Town and any other places I saw it's now in, in, in Gauteng as well. These are poor people, they're homeless, and we are going to disregard the land rights of the owners. That, that's a trend that's worrying me. The Constitution provides reassurance and peace of mind for the bulk of our South African citizens. I think, personally for myself and a lot of other people, this, this is the one pillar of strength that we can cling to, and it's still there. It's extremely good. What are some of the red lights? The quality and professionalism of some judges. It's sad, but it's true. It's there, and we've got to become more and more worried. If one of the supreme legal minds in South Africa, a person like Jeremy Gauntlet, unsuccessfully applied to become a judge on numerous occasions, then you've got to start questioning this. It was interesting, the last time he was rejected, soon thereafter, the government needed a, one of the sharpest legal minds in the country, and it briefed Jeremy Gauntlet to act on its behalf, but he's not good enough to become a judge. I will refer here to the death penalty, um, it was abolished, but there was a, a certain farmer who instructed his workers to take the, the bodies of people who, were, who died don't know how they died, on his farm and feed it to the lions on his farm. Now, this farmer was eventually found guilty of murder. And the judge said, if the death penalty still existed, I would impose the death penalty on you. You deserve the death penalty. It was a horrific crime. But you know what? It was mutilation of a dead body. You cannot kill a corpse. The people were dead when they were fed to the lions. This judge could not distinguish between a corpse and a living person. And that's why he gave that sentence. The deviations from the letter and spirit of the Constitution are becoming increasingly problematic, as we can see with the whole issue of land rights. I'm concluding and with this one. And this is equal justice. And then fortunately, we have this beautiful one with justice walking away and having done the job quite correctly. And that's why I trust in our legal system and say thank you. And that's the end of my story. Thank you very much, Rana. What an extensive presentation and how complicated it is. I, for one, had no idea just in the Bill of Rights there were so many subsections covering so much of our existence in this country. I just want to say this has been fascinating. Thank you, Werner. It gives us so much insight and throws a light on some of the problems we are experiencing. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes. Werner. In fact, I have several questions. What is the 
difference between the application of traditional law and what you might call Western law. Can any person, white, black, or whatever, say that I am subject to traditional law, or are there certain restrictions? It will depend on the cases. Let me use another example. There was a, a Miss South Africa, which is open to all people of all races, and then there was a Miss Black South Africa. And the Miss Black South Africa, as part of this, the women were bare-breasted. This was in a public event. Now, if that had been an, an the ordinary one, with all people being present there, that would have been public indecency. But because these African women claim that as part of their tradition, they are, and they can walk bare-breasted. You even saw this recently with the, the death of the king, Goodwill's Zwilatini. There was a group of bare-breasted dancers there. And this was shown on television. And if you were to say, but this is nudity on television, the answer would be, but this is part of custom. And we all know this is part of custom. So it will depend on the case and how you actually prove it. There was recently a case as well where a person entered into a building saying he was wearing clothes, uh, which he claimed to be traditional. I didn't know that tackies, white tackies were traditional, but he claimed it to be traditional and he got away with that. But if I were to do the, exactly the same thing, people say, no, 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 hang on. So this is where, you know, even the, the Dachau smoking Rastafarians, all of these things come into play. Uh, it's good that we understand the, the culture and the traditions of people. We've got to be very sensitive about this. Werner, you say that the, the Khoisan are now going beyond uh, 2013 to 1652. Uh, 1913, 1913. 1913 to 1652, mm. which I can understand. Do they also intend to direct their attention to the, the Isikosa and the Isizulu who moved down into the area, or the, are they restricting it to the Dutch? At this stage, it's predominantly the Dutch, but you, you're making a very interesting point. I'm reading Hermann Gilumier's book on, on the Afrikaners, and if you see what, what he found, and he's a good historian, where that interaction took place, and a lot of that land was actually used by the Khoisan, it could be interesting development. This Khoisan development has been very slow. But it's getting momentum. As you know, they've now also been granted traditional leadership status with new legislation. So they can also have a council. And I might be a bit facetious about this, but these are well-paid jobs as well. Can I just revert to the traditional thing? What about marriage? Yes, it's, it's respected. Traditional marriages are, are respected. As you know, Zuma, for instance, had a Western marriage, and that's why he and Kotsasana Dlamini Zuma got divorced. That was a Western marriage. But then he could still have traditional marriages as well, and limitless. It's as long as you can follow the, the culture and traditions. You, you might remember in his rape case, he, he sort of indicated that in their culture, it was okay for a man to dominate his sexual dominance over a woman. It didn't fly, of course. It's difficult to untangle some of these. For instance, Muslim marriages. I'm not well acquainted with all of that, but I know it can be terminated in a different way. And what about the rights of the women and the children? Our courts have addressed that. And our courts are now very more sympathetic towards the rights of other people that emanate from such a marriage. This land restitution and expropriation without compensation. You know, there are a whole lot of uh, houses in uh, full clip here. Uh, so they can be occupied willy-nilly. Is, is, can that happen? Is that a, a possibility? It's highly unlikely to be the case. That's not the focus of attention of the 
government. It's mainly rural land. And in my next talk, I will be discussing this issue as well. It's a very complicated thing. We all focus on land, but it's property that's involved. Now, one of the scary things about this legislation is that you can expropriate property, which could mean theoretically intellectual rights. Now, as you are aware, with the current COVID situation, our government became party to this and the African Union as well, saying that we must ex virtually expropriate the rights of Johnson & Johnson, and then we can manufacture it cheaply because we don't have to look after the protection of the intellectual rights, not comprehending that it's costing billions to research and develop new products. And that's the one that scares me more than just property, is the intellectual rights and other non-tangible rights that can worry me. Uh, I don't think we need worry, although if you read the, the Freedom Charter, and I referred to this in the beginning. If you refer to that, they definitely refer to unoccupied houses. And people like Malema, uh, they have definitely referred to unoccupied houses. I don't think it's the ANC government's main focus. They realize this is not going to work in practice, but it's mainly agricultural land and other land that can be used for new housing developments. If they expropriate your house in, in, in full clip for argument's sake, it's going to house one or two families, maybe three, but it's not solving the problem. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. If that's if they start with that, there's going to be such a knee-jerk reaction from investors throughout the world that uh, they'll quickly abandon any idea of that. That's what I personally believe. Rather, I know there's a list of amendments, 17. Without going to into too much detail, can you just say in broad terms, what were these other constitutional amendments about? Some of them were just purely semantic, clarifying issues as they developed over the years. One of the major changes was in the legal system. 